has stopped. Good morning, everybody. Can everybody uh, hear me uh, and see my screen? Yes. Perfect, perfect. I can't see anybody, so I'm uh, going to run through this. Um, <clears throat> well, thank you very much for this uh, opportunity. Uh, my name is uh, Mark Fowler. I'm joined by my colleague, uh, Miguel uh, Peña. Um, I'm responsible and look after the Middle East, Africa and the UK. Um, Miguel heads up our engineering department uh, and is based in Madrid. So we are quite, uh, quite spread out. I'm going to be talking today about embedded rail systems and uh, level crossing systems or slab track systems as many of us call them. Um, and the presentation will be split into three. So I'm going to do a quick, uh, um, uh, a few slides on, on the company and who we are, and then there'll be the embedded track system and then there'll be the slab track system. No further ado. And it's not working, of course. Our company, um, we manufacture track systems or baluster systems for uh, all of the industries, uh, ranging from obviously the light rails through to the uh, the crane uh, crane rails. Um, so we're going from four ton axle loads to 120 ton wheel loads. Um, Though we started, uh, the company started about 100 years ago, um, we've been uh, well established in the local and international market since uh, basically the early 70s. So, uh, and our rail systems are known um, throughout these uh, markets for the, obviously for the electrical insulation, uh, track vibration reduction, uh, short installation times, and of course the minimum amount of maintenance uh, required on our systems. We contribute also to the sustainability infrastructure, um, as most companies do, and uh, we, we start by using the recycled materials and involving into green, into green technologies. Um, within our company, we work uh, and supply different types of services, and, and some of those services are designs and testing, uh, application engineering, which Miguel uh, is the head of, uh, construction support, uh, maintenance advice, consultation and supervision. So it's quite a broad spectrum uh, of what we can do. If I look at the system design and testing, here on the left we have an embedded rail system with a standard uh, 5061 profile. Um, as you'll notice by looking at the, the channel, we've included everything that's required. So whether it's the vertical uh, alignment, the horizontal alignment, uh, we have tubes or or uh, filler blocks for material reduction. We can incline the rail uh, and we can also add um, a continuous rail strip, which will um, change the stiffness of the system. On the right, you can see that we have our own testing facility. Um, our MTS machines will work on any of our systems, whether it's an embedded rail system or another system, which is an embedded block systems, which we won't be talking about today. But we have all the facilities in house to do these testings. Miguel, if you can describe what application engineering does. <laughs> yes, this this slide is about the uh, my department, which is the application engineering department. And this gives you an overview of all the uh, services that we offer. Uh, well, drawings, uh, calculations, advice, and uh, well, BIM. We also have um, a library that uh, we will be discussing later. Uh, well, it's basically about uh, uh, providing uh, all the Edelon Cedra subsidiaries uh, all over the world with all these services, and in turn, uh, we will be providing those to our clients. So, yeah, yeah. This is this is just a glimpse of the uh, BIM objects that are um, available in our BIM library. I would uh, recommend that you uh, visit our BIM library in that website that you can see uh, down below. Uh, where if you have any interest, you can uh, download uh, 
a number of BIM objects, including ERS, LCS, and uh, embedded block system as well. Thank you. Yeah. Part of our um, uh, um, deliverables is also construction support. Um, here you can see two types. We can we want on the elevated section on a bridge in the Netherlands and on the left, it's at a London Underground a rice slip depot. Um, basically, we can uh, assist in um, advising you how to remove all the, the old systems and to place in the new systems. I'm just flying through slides at the moment because I'm very conscious that I have, uh, I want to keep it to 45 minutes so that we have time to discuss anything afterwards. Uh, again, construction support. Uh, this is a quite an, a complicated project that um, we worked on um, in Birmingham. And here you can see it's a double junction. Um, and with two two diamonds, uh, and I think the tightest curve there was 24 meters. And so we had to design uh, all the different types of slabs integrate them with the interfaces and then um, advise on the installation and the um, uh, construction method. So we're together with Colas. Sustainability, again, this is something which is very uh, uh, high in our um, uh, strategy. We want to become a non-carcinogenic uh, supplier. So uh, addition, Back in the old days, all the materials had uh, carcinogenic um, uh, components, and this is now not the case. We've managed to get rid of this. We've managed to start moving much more uh, closer to a, a green uh, or greener, as it can in, in chemicals, solution. So we're reusing uh, uh, renewable raw materials, um, uh, recycling. Uh, it goes throughout the whole company. Uh, when we design and design our systems, uh, we design them towards the standard EN uh, and ISO uh, performance guides. Uh, our company is 9001 qualified and holds the 14001 environmental management system. I'd like to talk now, step into the embedded rail systems. Um, now embedded rail systems is in all essence uh, I think it's it's the future of moving forward. There was there was an article in in, in the news, the UK newspaper lately about buckling of of rail because of the heat. Now, in some places, uh, I, I was in London last last week, and uh, the trains were all slowing down because of this issue. Now, um, I wonder if the track is embedded. Besides the the issue of the costs. I wonder to myself if uh, the rail is embedded, if you had had that same issues of um, extreme temperatures, whether it's hot or cold, and uh, having uh, issues with the track and the speed limits and, and trains not moving. I wonder if it's a, if it would change. Just a thought. Our embedded rail system in all essence is a floating rail track system. We don't have anything which is mechanical in there. So uh, what we do is we have we align this this rail in the uh, a channel and we pour liquid around it, which solidifies and holds the rail in place. The only thing that we need to have from the contractor or from the, the civils is to have a solid place to work in. So concrete channels, steel channels, uh, whichever um, will hold the, the track in, in its position. So what does it provide us? Um, and by the way, please don't think anything into the types of rail pictures that I'm using, both grooved and vignol. It's just to give you a selection of thoughts and, and, and ideas what we can do. Obviously, with embedded rail, um, you have the maximum uh, integration into a structure uh, provides you with a minimum construction height. Um, so really, it's it's the best that you can you can get. 
Um, it provides the accessibility um, of people in roles in, in roll stores, uh, wheelchairs um, and uh, bicycles and things like that crossing the track. Um, obviously, for uh, electrification, um, it has ideal uh, installation values. Um, because it's in, uh, the rail is completely embedded, there is um, an absolute minimum of maintenance required. And in fact, we, we market uh, this, this product actually as a, a maintenance free system. Um, typically, a lot of contractors are not keen on that. But um, this is this is a, a benefit of an embedded rail system. It increases the life because of that. Some of the more uh, keen features um, of the embedded rail system. Um, because the, the rail is embedded uh, fully in, a, in this polymer, liquid polymer, it uh, provides uh, both continuous and uh, elastic vertical and lateral support. Um, we have, as you can see in the drawing on point 11 here, we have the, uh, the possible use of adding um, uh, continuous rail strip. This cont continuous rail strip will change the stiffness of the track formation. So you'll be going from a standard stiffness, which is without uh, the rail strip, and then you'll have a, a deflection of less than a millimetre. Include the strip and your deflection will go to what we call a medium stiffness, which is between one and two millimeters. Within the system itself, um, you can here you can see tubes. These are two uh, PVC tubes. Now, this has no uh, reference to putting cables through there whatsoever. Um, it's just purely for uh, material saving. We can also have it with filler blocks. Um, it just re reduces the, the kilos of core cloth that we actually would uh, need to, to fill this, which was a, a, a significant uh, commercial uh, reduction in price. You can use this system in um, basically everything. Uh, you might have seen from Birmingham, we had the double switches, so it's applicable in switches and crossings. Uh, bridges, um, depots, it's used everywhere. And because of its installation speed, uh, we've been able to, um, you know, to use it in the most busiest of areas. And again, as I mentioned earlier, this thing, uh, one of the main features of this type of system is the accessibility of road vehicles, emergency vehicles. Um, which is quite important nowadays. Uh, the installation of the system, uh, I'm just going to quickly just show you or look, describe to you how it's installed. Once you have the, the channel, you, you need to, to sandblast the channel edges to create uh, a proper bonding surface. Uh, if you don't do this, you'll have the latents and you'll be just bonding to a very thin sliver of, of, of dried milky concrete um, and any knock will just break it and you'll get to debonding and we don't want the de debonding we want to have it uh, bonded straight to the concrete so there's no water ingress so we sandblast the channels and then to add the strip we will apply some uh, adhesive and then we will lay the um, strips through the channel um, if the slab has been delivered and was poured in situ, then we have to uh, a primer the slab uh, there and then. If the slab is being precast, that's normally a job done um, at the precaster. In the rail, uh, you have um, also you have to get to an SA2 uh, level, so there can't be rust on it. There's no point in us embedding a rusty rail. So we take the rust off and we primer the rail as well. Um, and then before the rail goes in, it's uh, it's double checked to make sure there's no rust spots that can uh, um, be taken forward. Uh, part two is on is the alignments and leveling. So there's two types of methods. You can do the bottom up or top down. 
Uh, personally, I prefer bottom up, but many prefer top down. Uh, the bottom up uh, version uh, basically is your survey is going to come along and at one and a half meters uh, placements, they will check the vertical height. Uh, shims, vertical shims will be added to get the correct distance um, and then the rail is laid. Once the rail is laid, uh, the tubes go in and then the cork wedges on the side will create the horizontal alignment. So in that in essence, you've got both the vertical and the horizontal. Uh, with the top down, you would use uh, track alignment portals. Uh, these will be set at exactly the right level to have, and you hang the, the rail from these portals and pour. Um, fixing the rail. Um, Stop the core class leaving and pouring out of the channel. We will just put a blocker and then seal. Um, and once everything is ready, and just before we start to pour, we will then go along um, and respray a, a, an activation primer. And this activation primer will uh, will trigger everything off. And within an hour, you can start pouring your core class. Uh, once you pour your core class, you, you'll always start from the six foot and then pour down until you get the right height in the flange way. Uh, stop the pouring, wait till it cures slightly and then come back and do a, a top up pour on the, in the six foot. Uh, curing times, as you can see, so uh, in the latest days we'd have been cured in one and a half hours because it's between 30 and 40 degrees. So. It's quite a fast curing material. And when we state uh, one and a half hours curing time, um, that's when traffic can drive over it. Uh, the ERS um, can be used in, in all types of applications. And here you can see uh, a good selection of them, uh, level crossings, bridges, terminals, tunnels, depots, ports, et cetera, et cetera. Um, also, what we do is uh, our ERS goes with slab track system. So this is leading on to the second part of my presentation. Um, the slabs here in this picture, uh, we could go down to a standard 150 meter radius with our three meter slabs. Um, as you can see in the pictures, just gets dropped in quite nicely. Um, we can use uh, in the cross section, you can see the two rails together with the UCB 50 block. Um, so we can put our check rail into the channel as well. We are doing that in several locations at the moment. Uh, it's quick to install and the concrete uh, should have a, a lifespan of about 50 years. And it's dependent on um, the rail frequency would be dependent on, on how often we have to change the rail. Normally, it's 20, 25 years, but if the rail is hardened, uh, head hardened, then maybe it's longer. Uh, this is something I'm not 100% sure on. Uh, bridges, um, here we've integrated the embedded rail system through the bridge. This is a steel one, but it can also be done on concrete. Um, and it's easy to integrate. Uh, the construction height plays a, a major role here. Um, the embedded rail system also reduces the vibrations from the track uh, into the main construction. Um, stations. Um, this is, I was talk, discussing this with Miguel earlier. In this, this is a station in Spain, and you can see on the, on the track that they have the international gauge and the Spanish gauge, but the left hand rails uh, are in one channel. So this comes back to the drawing that uh, I showed earlier. Um, it's flat system. Uh, one of the, especially today's um, circumstances, one of the main uh, points around a train station is security. Now with a flat track system like this, you can't hide anything. So it's open, plain, clean. Everybody can see if there's something laying there. 
if there's an accident in any of the tunnels or any of the, the track systems which are difficult to get to with an embedded rail system, the uh, ambulances or, or, or uh, police fire trucks, they can all, the services, they can all get to into the tunnel by driving straight along the track. Tunnels, uh, same is, as we just mentioned. Um, here again, we have the, the height uh, thing, so the uh, it offers a, a, a optimal reduction of the the cross section. Um, and here we have a, the Euro tunnel, of course, which we we, we supplied. Um, and again, electrical isolation. It's a it's a clean, easy installation. Grass track. Uh, the picture on the right is from Jersey, Germany. And the picture on the left is an upcoming project that we're working on. Um, and you can see we can add the uh, the green track into an into our design. And this one I think is a ladder design. But here you notice the filler blocks instead of um, tubes. Depots. Uh, I think I believe the one on the left is Dubai. I believe so. Um, and the one on the right, uh, Geneva. This is industries, so uh, basically uh, uh, trades driving through the, the, the ports, not the cranes, um, and the reach stackers driving over the, the tracks, getting up to 100 ton, 120 tonne uh, axle loads different types of core classes for different types of jobs. They don't all work for the same, uh, the same multi-use, uh, it's all different. Crane rail systems. I don't think there's many crane rail guys here. Uh, references, uh, 1500 kilometers in the world of references. So um, I think some of you have actually worked on these systems um i know some of you have uh, the level crossing system you have to apologize my presentation is not as fluid as it should be uh, i have problems with moving to the next slide um this is uh done on network rail this is the new haven uh level crossing um uh, south southeast london southeast uh, england uh here there was a there was a big problem with water and um, constant battle with how to improve it. And we applied our uh, level crossing system here, the slabs, and resolved the situation. We built the track, the, the subsoil up, um, and made a, a, a suitably strong uh, sub base, and then placed our, our um, slabs on top. It's very easy. There's no maintenance at all. The system's been in for the past five years, four years, I think. Um, and there's been no maintenance on it at all. Uh, uh, there's been no complaints. It's worked and looking uh, very, very nice. Uh, the town council's very happy with it. Um, the slab is basically designed. This is just one of our factories in the UK. The slab is basically designed according to the Euro codes one and two. Um, and uh, it's class as D4, so the heaviest categories. Slabs two and a half meters, 2.4 meters wide uh, on the top. And then the slabs come in basically three meter or four meter lengths. Any, any, any larger than that, then we would be looking at uh, too heavy. Um, there's no minimum size of the slabs, um, as if you have a radius in this uh, of 24 meters, instead of using straight slabs, we, we have the ability of tapering our slabs and indeed also tapering the channels, uh, uh, curving the channels so that we can accommodate uh, tighter curves. Um, the slabs are designed uh, for 30 ton road traffic. Um, and I know sometimes in the UK that you get 40 tons. This has also been uh, tested and, uh, and approved. Uh, the rail 
uh, a standard heavy load, five and 20, 25 ton uh, axle loads. The concrete quality is 45.55. Um, and on top of all our slabs, we have a skid resistant surface, which is a, a rectly rhombus uh, imprint. But again, it could be anything. It's that's, this is just a an imprint. Uh, we have skid results for the different uses that we uh, we have. Um, here, as you can see, it's 1,900 kilos per meter slab. So. Uh, you're going past the, the four meters and then you're looking at over eight tons. Then you have to start thinking about the size of crane that you will be using to put them into place. Some of the options that we, we supply with our slabs are uh, flangeways uh, widening so that the, uh, the rail coming from the baluster track uh, goes into the slab and you have a flange a widener so um, if there is any issues with the wheel the flange widener will uh, uh, flared flange will um, be appropriate on the um, uh, flangeway side we have a steel uh, lip uh, as you can see um, this is the steel lip here and this is a, a new design um, and it will hold and uh, protect the concrete edge from any road vehicles. And we also have uh, a drainage system uh, at the end of each slab, which we can use uh, to, to direct water away from the uh, slabs. And obviously we're pouring uh, our core cost into the into the level, level crossing system or the LCS plates. Installation on a sand bed. Basically, when we install a level crossing, we're going to be using uh, quite a, a large chunk to be cut out. So it's a slab plus um, five meters on either side. Um, again, this is something which maybe Miguel would be able to help us with. Five meters either side, sometimes it's not possible. Um, and when it's not possible, we, we have to discuss it with our engineering department to find out what we can do and how we can do it, uh, because the, it's the, it's, I suppose it's the area which is transitioned from the slab to baluster track. Yeah, it, let, let me, let me uh, clarify that this uh, installation method that we are going to discuss here, installation on sand bed, uh well uh, it's something that we apply on on level crossings obviously but but it, it's the same thing in any uh section of of track uh we have two basic methods for installation one of them is the installation on sand bed uh and then uh, we have the grouting method that we're going to uh discuss uh later basically it's the same thing but in one method, we just use a, a sand layer to uh, uh, to support our uh, slabs, and in the other uh, method, we we undergrout the uh, the slabs. Well, as you can see, everything starts with uh, with uh, the excavation of the of the area of the level crossing area. We have to leave uh, five meters on both sides of the level crossing to allow for some sort of transition between the, the slab track and the ballasted track. And, and also a little bit of allowance at both sides of the of the slab, approximately one meter, in order to manage the interface between the road and the and the slab. Then we proceed to the compaction of the level crossing area. This is a I, I must add that this is a crucial step because it it uh, well Everything is about uh, avoiding uh, ground settlements here. The third step is laying a 30 millimeter uh, layer of fine leveled uh, sand. As you can see in this picture, there's like uh, there there are two guiding rules on both sides of this layer, uh, and uh, well, they just level that with a uh, with a uh, with a ruler uh, uh, that rolls on those guides then placing the slabs with a, the with the help of a crane as you can see in uh, step number four 
Well, in step number five, we we are checking the width of the gaps between between the slabs because then we that will allow us for uh, filling the gaps with a, a joint sealing material, which by the way can be um, corklast as well. Huh? So same material that we're using for embedment, but we need to make sure that these gaps are uh, have a, a width uh, between ten and twenty five millimeters so that they, they can be properly filled and they function as a, as a, an elastic joint. Afterwards, uh, in step number seven, there's the ERS installation. That's the pouring of core glass, basically. Of course, we, uh, with the alignment of the rail prior to that and with the application of primers yeah, before that, as we just discussed. And finally, we can install drainage, uh, as you can see there, uh, and final cleanup. Then the installation with grouting is is like like the installation of the sand bed, but um, you can see that after the compaction of the of the level crossing area, we use uh, some sort of foam frames uh, to be installed on the ground. These foam frames will hold the uh, the grout that we will inject later. Then the slabs are placed on top of those frames, as you can see in step number four. Yeah, in step number five, you will see that um, we use uh, um, alignment devices. Well, you can see, I don't know if you can see, but in uh, in this photograph in number five, yeah, there, uh, we use a hydraulic jack, which pulls or which lifts this uh, 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 leveling device uh, so that we can, we can properly align the slab. Uh, the slabs are fitted with uh, grouting ports. Um, these grout imports, then we we use them to inject the the cementitious grout. Mm. Uh, we also have to fill the joints as per step six. Step seven, ERS installation, same thing, and uh, final uh, installation of drainage, other interfaces I should add, and final cleanup. So these are the two basic methods. Yeah. I would like to add there, Miguel, thank you. I'd like to add there that during the undergrouting of the slabs, as seen in picture five, um, once the slabs are undergrouted, this does not mean that we have to stop uh, installation of the ERS system. The, the jacks are held in place and will keep the slab alignment um, uh, strong enough that we can lay the rail in and carry on installing the ERS. So that um, once I think the, it takes a couple of hours for the grout to cure, uh, yep. the grout then comes to 40 megapascals, if I'm not correct. Yes. Within yeah. a couple of hours. And then um, uh, so during the same time, you can install the embedded rail system. Yeah, correct. Here is a, a double uh, level crossing. So this is quite unique because you have the interface between the slab, the ballast, slab, ballast. Um, and uh, you can clearly see the uh, anti-slip um, and the steel nosing. Now, um, the stiffnesses will try, they will try to marry the stiffnesses of the two systems, so the ballasted and the ballastless track, uh, to marry so that there are no dipping. Here, um, one of our projects, I think one of the guys who's busy with this project is online today. Um, and this is in uh, Fredericia. And here you can see that you know, the, the slabs go around the curves without any issues or any problems. Fredericia, sorry, Denmark, yes. Okay, gentlemen, this is it. Uh, thank you very much for your uh, uh, your time and patience and uh, I've hit 45, 40 minutes. So um, thank you uh, and I'll put it back to uh, uh, to the class to find out if there are any more questions. Richard.
Brilliant. Thanks, guys. Really, really interesting on the uh, <clears throat> a lot, a lot covered there in in, th in 35, 40 minutes. So, yeah, thanks for that. So we've got some questions in the chat. Um, yeah. So we've got oh, we've got a couple there from Pat, Pat Dickinson. Uh, do you use a standard arrangement for fish plates at IBJ locations? Also, when using fish plates with bonding wire, do you lay wires directly in the polymer? Uh, yeah. Question. Yes. Uh, well, normally we don't um, embed fish plates because it really doesn't make a lot of sense. Uh, well, if it's if it's an embedded, if it's an uh, uh, a temporary fish plate, of course we don't. If it's uh, permanent, uh, the only thing that we can do is to enlarge the the channel to fit the uh, the regular fish plate. That's it. Uh, so no, obviously when there's a fish plate present, uh, we cannot have the uh, the PVC tubes or the uh, filler blocks. So it's it's kind of a special place, but. Absolutely no, no issues. It's all about um, making the, the, the channel a little bit uh, wider. Right. OK, and then you just fold that up. Is this pads approved for a uh, rail mainline? And so what track category? I guess it would go. Yes, it's, it is approved. We have got pads for both uh, um, the uh, uh, LCS and the ERS. The ERS has actually been since uh, 30 years, 25 years. Um, right. rail track system, I guess rail track days. Right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, but, but but I, I should add that the uh, the the approvals that we have include uh, for several uh, traffic uh, types and in different uh, railway administrations include different kind of t of uh, rail paths and different kinds of core class. So it's it's not only about the pad itself; it's about the the whole system. Yeah. Okay. One um, from Dave Parry. Uh, are there any limitations on the maximum cant to pour the polymer? We so are talking about tra track track cant or yes. track slope. I, track cant, I I understand, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the, the, well, yeah. no, no, actually, no. There's, um, of course, there's um, there's a special technique. Uh, when you have very steep uh, horizontal, uh, sorry, um, track cant, or mm -hmm. uh, you have a very steep uh, rail ramp inclination, mm -hmm. because you, you need to pour a layer of core glass, let partially cure, then pour another layer of core glass. So yes, we even have a frequently asked question document about that because this is this is a question that comes uh, from time to time mm. but the answer is no there's there's no no limitation but it uh, requires a special technique for uh core class pouring okay well that, that kind of answers uh alexander's question as well about the vertical gradient oh well no actually he's asking it to eliminate limitations the vertical gradient of the whole system rather than just the, the polymer. No. Not really. Uh, we have had uh, ERS installed or core class board in in quite a steep uh, gradients. Um, I remember like th 35 per meal. That is 3.5 percent. In some, I believe it was in, in the tramway of Tenerife in Spain or something. Uh, well. So again, it's not an issue, um, a practical issue when it comes to the uh, performance of the track. Uh, it only requires a special te technique when pouring core glass. Yeah. OK, uh, Dave Brooks and the rail, he's asking. Oh, he's asking two questions. So uh, how do you design manage the transition from your slab system to ballasted? Any specific requirements around welding and stressing? Yeah. Very good question. Um, mm. uh, transitions between ERS and, and ballasted track. Um, 
there okay we can we can propose uh transition designs of our own uh design uh, uh, but for instance here in spain adif already has a, a standard trans uh, transition uh, between ers and, and ballasted track which includes um um an improvement of the of the subsoil in the transition area. It also includes um, a, a ballast retaining walls on the sides. And uh, in some instances, it could be necessary to uh, extend the transition into the, the rail pad. So so the, the rail pad would there will be a section of rail pad which will have an intermediate stiffness between the main ERS section and the and the ballasted track. Uh, again, that's that's a little bit depending on the railway administration on the uh, specific characteristics of the of the tracks that we're using. But uh, yes, there are, there are certain available designs for that. Mm, yeah, yeah, that sounds. There. Sounds familiar with, with transitions to slab tracks. That's good. Um, what modulus of deformation? No, no, sorry, no, I think we skipped one. Are there any specific? We, oh, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Any specific requirements around stress and welding? I think that was. Well, yeah, I guess that's generic you know, generally as well as in the transition. Mm, yeah, but I'm not sure if uh, David Brooks uh, referred to, for instance, to the to the installation of the ERS, uh, the stressing or the welding of the rail when when uh, installing ERS. I guess uh, in in this case, the uh, when it comes to welding, no, uh, it's much better to weld the the rails outside of the channels. Then put the rails on the channels, obviously. And when it comes to the fixing of the rail, uh, we always uh, recommend to fix the rail at its neutral temperature plus minus five uh, degrees, so that when the rail is fixed, it it's not suffering excessive uh, well stresses from yeah. from thermal. Yeah. Okay. Um... What modulus deformation values designed is the system designed to? Yeah, very good question. It's uh, the, the 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 precast the slabs that we uh, apply with ERS. So so to say, the LCS slabs have been designed for a um, uh, modulus of deformation of 100 megapascals obtained from the load plate test. Um, this means that uh, normally in, I, I believe in all European uh, networks, uh, the sub ballast uh, will provide you with 120 megapascals in, with the low plate test. That means that we have a margin of uh, safety in all our designs, mm. at least from the point of view of the integrity of our slabs. And then if it's then if the if the subsoil uh, deformation uh, is less than the hundred megapascals, then we start to look at undergrouting the, uh, the slabs. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good stuff. Wow, there's some good questions here. So I'm yeah. Impressed. Um, so moving back on to, uh, you did ask as well, kind of cater for third and fourth rail systems. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yes, fine, yeah. well, we, um, we have seen uh, um, an example in Spain with a dual gauge uh, with three rails. Okay. Uh, and there's another example that I know from Spain, because in Spain we have all sorts of <laughs> track gauges uh, yeah. where we, we have had four, four rails in a, in a single slab. Yeah. Right. Okay. Um, so back to Alexander Reynolds, we what is the, the tightest horizontal radii system can be used with? Mm, good one. Uh, we have had a specific, um, and I'm again thinking of an example here in Spain, which is quite extreme. Uh, we have had 23 meter radius 
in a in a roundabout in a tram in a in the tramway in Valencia capital in the, in the Valencia city. Uh, I think it was third, uh, 23 meters radius uh, in the tram. In a tram, if you know, Valencia is a very uh, warm uh, area. And we're proud to say that that has been in service since the since the 1990s. So <laughs> very, <laughs> very it steep works. curve, a lot of heat. It is still working. Nice. All right. I don't think we're going to have it get down to 23 meters over here but you never know um right so and Birmingham uh, we also did 24 meters on the double oh, junction yeah. oh yeah that's go, correct yeah. that's correct mm -hmm. um and then finally Dave Parry uh you show a photo of a precast modules uh, around curves what's the typical length of the discrete units and how do you manage transitions and track twist yeah good good question as well uh uh, the typical length of the of the unit is three meters, and that but, but that's our, so to say, our standard unit uh, for for tight curves, right? Uh, but that will, if we if we use that in combination with the straight channels, it will only allow us for around 150 meter radius uh, curves. If we go um, with a with a um, a tighter radius, then we will have to resort to curved channels. Mm. Um, but that will be some sort of bespoke slab designs that we can do as well, and we mm. do it uh, on a regular basis. But we always try to use uh, more standard designs. Mm. Okay. Um, I think and, Miguel. If, I think Miguel. If, you, if, if correct me if I'm wrong. Um, when you start to to look at curves and you start to look at uh, radius just uh, dropping below the 150 mark, um, I think we can if we start to reduce the length of our slabs, we can get around the the, the, the curves uh, uh, in the first instance. And when this doesn't work, then we will start to look at the the um, how to curve the, the the track. And then ultimately going down those tight channels, it's going to be the curved. Uh, track uh, in the in the slabs and also a tapered slab within the uh, as well. So you've got everything um, possible to to make sure that you get around that curve. Well, the the example in Birmingham is perfect because uh, about this question because in the, in that case what we did was basically a, a puzzle of uh, of slabs with different yeah. uh, which were fit for different curvatures. Uh, we had like six different kind of uh, slab geometries that we we would be using along the, the the track alignment in order to cover everything in the in the in the optimal way. Um, so yeah, we that that's how we do that from from a geometry point of view. Excellent, excellent. Well, that's it for the questions. Some thanks everyone for the for some really good challenging questions there and enjoyed that um we normally dave wood says his tradition of, of asking everyone to to thank the presenters by unmuting their mics and we'll give them a, a round of applause so if we could do that say thank you to mark and, and miguel that'd be much appreciated oh there you go or just do the graphic with a round of applause that's even better yeah <laughs> prefer that but yeah thanks guys that's um Really, really interesting. Really good. And and I guess we can, if, if anyone's got any questions, we can um, they can get in touch with me or drop you a, a line at you know your, your website or whatever. Um, as Mark said, you know we're working with lots of different consultancies across the UK. Um, a few people have dropped me messages off offline saying that they're working um, various schemes. So that's that's really good. Um, so yeah, thank you very much for that. And um, yeah, if the, this will be recorded so it's available to, to members. If anyone wants to pass it on to, to anyone, that's available through the PWI website. And and yeah, so thanks very much. And may I, may I add, so thank you very much for the opportunity here. Um, and if there are any technical questions or queries from the guests, 
uh, to get in contact with you um, and then to pass it through to Miguel because uh, to be honest, I'm more commercial, as you probably <laughs> realised, <laughs> and Miguel answers all the difficult questions. So, um, but he would be delighted to um, to answer any of the questions and just to have a one-on-one -on -one chat with him. Um, please feel free to, to to contact him. Yes, of course. Yeah, definitely. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah. Right. Thanks very much, everyone. Thanks for all.